So I'll talk about architectural humanities. So we are kind of like, um, we're kind of like the United Colors of Benetton for architecture. Our architects are not male, pale, and stale, which a lot of architecture is. People look like me, right? They're overweight, pale, and they do big buildings. Our architects come from all walks of life. They come from every nation on earth, and they come from different religions, they come from uh, uh, different viewpoints, left, right, you name it. But they come under one idea, which is how do we create better environments for our community? So as noted, we're not just about providing professional design services, but we also do the construction. We do the design, development, and construction of those facilities. And the reason that's important is all of you here are creative people. And all of you have the potential inside to come up with a solution that can improve the lives of millions of people. The big difference is, is you have to build it. It doesn't matter unless you build change. You can design you know, a holistic solution for Haiti, but unless you build it, it hasn't affected a single life. So it's important for our teams to remember that our clients, the people that will end up using our buildings, they rely on us not to design a better structure, but to build one. We also look at building buildings not for the sake of structures, but to create social and economic change. When I think about sustainability, it's not just about the materials you use or the energy you consume. It's, do people actually love the structure? I mean, you can build a zero energy city in the middle of the desert, and it looks like shit, and nobody loves it. But, you know, if you build something where the community just it embraces it, they feel they have ownership over it, that is a cultural sustainability. They will maintain and look after it. And if you infuse an economic engine, so you're not just saying we're going to house you, but we're going to give you a mechanism so you can have your own economy, then people embrace that architecture much more readily. So, talking about our professionals, our architects are a little crazy. I will admit. So, hands up, any of you remember the TV show MacGyver from the 1980s? Most of you are not that old, but so MacGyver was this guy, you give him like chewing gum and he makes like a, 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 a whole new vehicle out of it, right? Our architects are like PhD MacGyver, right? They're super small, but you know, a, a good example is Eric Cezanne. Eric, who runs a Haiti office, he has three master's degrees, architecture, building uh, science, and construction management. But he has a, a moral compass that says he can't just sit down and talk about something. He has to build it. So you know, if he's working on a project and he realizes that the talking, talking, talking is actually affecting the community, he says, it's time to build and to shut up and get it done. So they really have this kind of real push and drive. And they not only uh, um, consult and work with the community, they live in those communities. So they spend upwards of two years living in the villages and towns. We also don't look to replace local architects. We also marry. We're like a dating service, an online dating service. You know, if you're like a hot, young, emerging architect and you want to work with like an established local architect, we're your dating service. We will put you with a, a local professional who will work on the ground and that we will partner you and, and, and have this kind of understanding, marrying new technologies and new thinking about design with a kind of cultural understanding of how to get things built. And then, of course, engaging the community as part of the process of design. They're not recipients, they're not guinea pigs, but they're active components in the design process because they're going to build a building. I don't believe in sweat equity. I don't believe that you should do it for free. If you're a community that is in abject poverty, the idea of an international NGO coming in and saying, we're going to build a school for you, but you have to do it for free, is almost uh, criminally negligent. You're basically telling poor people, you have to work for free because we're giving you a present. You have to pay the community to build a building. So if we're going to pay people to build a strong, sound building, we have to train uh, them with the construction expertise to make sure that we do that. And, and we do that by involving them in the design process, integrating that cultural sustainability we talked about. And then, um, you know, I think this is in uh, rural Lesotho. You know, what I love about those photos is I think these are the only hard hats in this part of the country. You know, we, we instill international building codes in all of our projects and make sure that we adhere to uh, a local code system, but quite often we're actually engaging 
in a, in a much greater, much stronger uh, uh, professional standard. The other thing is that reconstruction should be about creating jobs. So, you know, the earthquake in the south here in Italy, there shouldn't be a single person unemployed right now. Every person in that town should have a job and get paid for it. Right? It's a mechanism to start new businesses around reconstruction. So part of our responsibility as architects is not just to build the buildings, but how do we create jobs within that community. And then of course, and I will talk about this later, that we open source all of our work. So we use Creative Commons, which is a legal licensing mechanism that allows you, the designer, to retain the creative control over your design and give it away for people you feel that have it. If you think that your design is going to save humanity, you can just put it in the public domain. Anyone can replicate your building for free. But if you feel that what you've designed actually has some financial merit in a for-profit sense, you can put a license on it that just says any nonprofit or any community in need can use this building for free. But if you're you know, living in Rome and you want this building, you've got to pay me for it. So actually, architects can get paid for their creative ideas around betterment. This is how most companies work. There's the head of the company, and they make an order, and everyone does what they say. This is an old way of thinking. This was a, an idea developed in 1962 by a guy called Paul Baran as a way to do distributed information about knowledge. Originally, this was done by the US Navy, because what they realized is that like some commander in the middle of nowhere would make an order that would adversely affect the lives of thousands of people. So someone in Washington, D.C. would say, hey, we should send that drone over to that village in Pakistan, and before you know it, you know, dozens of families have been killed, because they don't know the information on the ground. But with a distributed network, somebody who's local has much more intelligence and understanding about what's happening on the ground than the commander. Now, unfortunately, the US military didn't take this concept up. But who did take this up was technology people. This, this image is actually the birth of something we call the internet. This is how the internet was created, this map. And so, because I was a geek as a child, you know, and I played with computers as a kid, I think I was on the internet when I was like 11. Um, CompuServe, it was like the first dial-up and ring. So I love the idea of how do you do distributed networks. So why not build an architecture firm that is a distributed network where my, I'm not the president of the company. My title is Eternal Optimist. I'm like the chief cheerleader. You know, the, that's, that's my position. That's what people know me for. And so no, there is no head to cut off in the company. You know, because it's a company of many heads.